This Week in Radio Tech, episode 187, is brought to you by the Axia Radius IP Audio Console. Perfect for busy control rooms and production booths, and it plugs right into LiveWire. On the web at axiaaudio.com. And now, our feature presentation. Twirt. RJ45 connectors are truly important these days, and you've got to put them on right. See how to do it and how not to do it. All right, calm down. He says that to everyone. This calls for immediate discussion. What's up, Dad? All your days are belong to us. From his palatial office of important business. Or in a choice hotel in a distant land. This is Kirk Harnack. Andrew Zarian joins Chris Tobin and me for an instructional show, plus a look at the GFQ audio console one year later. You're dialed in to This Week in Radio Tech. Hey, welcome in. This is This Week in Radio Tech. I'm Kirk Harnack, your host. Glad to glad to be with you and to come into your home or your automobile or your Google Nexus 7 or your iPad or just your earbud, whatever it may be, and uh, talk about radio technology. We get letters literally from all around the world, emails and responses on our website and tweets, and we just really appreciate the kind of response that you as engineers and uh, maybe some junior engineers or retired engineers uh, uh, or people just interested in radio technology and audio technology, so glad that you feed back to us. Uh, what you're thinking and, and your appreciation of the show and maybe some clarification questions. We ought to do a show where we go through the mailbag. I keep saying we'll do that, and someday we actually will. So um, I'm the host of the show, and uh, I work for the folks at the Telos Alliance, who quite thankfully are also a sponsor of This Week in Radio Tech. Also with me, our co-host, uh, he's with us almost every show. It is the best-dressed engineer in radio from Manhattan, New York. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Chris Tobin. Hey, Chris, how are you? Why, well, thank you, everybody. What a night it's been. What a day. Uh, yeah, today I took the tie off, so it's good. Hey, uh, before I forget, when we start off, um, here in the New York uh, City market, we had a, a, an engineer pass away. Actually, he was retired and living in Plano, Texas. And I just mm. wanted to bring it to everyone's attention. Those who knew him knew uh, how, how nice a person he was. Doc Masumian. Uh, Doc was uh. former chief engineer of WQXR Radio here in New York City, the classical station of the New York Times back in the day. He uh, retired and went on to rep with the Northeast Broadcast Labs, with Bill Bingham and Chris Onan and the gang back in the day. Yeah. And then uh, he did some stuff with Harris and a few others. But uh, those of us who knew Doc, uh, let me just put it this way. For his age, uh, he was quite sprightly, and you could go out to a convention with him and guaranteed to be in trouble by 3 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> so just, uh, and those, those who know him uh, know exactly what I'm talking about. St. Louis SBE yeah. many years ago. We, uh, <laughs> we had a good time. All I remember is my boss was at a table, two tables away, and saw us leaving the, the restaurant. Next morning, he said to me, so that was your table making the noise and the manager and the waitresses dancing. I said, well, they were dancing near the table. I don't know about us, but yeah, it was, it was, we were near it. So that's the kind of guy Doc was. Uh, excellent person, uh, always thought about you know, the, the human element in broadcasting, was a genius when it came to engineering stuff, and uh, was always a quick wit. Uh, one thing I will impart on everyone he, um, he was uh, WQXR AM and FM. The AM station was uh, still, towers are still in Maspeth, Queens, which is smack in the center of residential area of Queens, New York. And uh, needless to say, 50,000 watt AM station, smack in the middle of a densely populated community. Uh, from time to time, you'll get phone calls from people saying, hey, I can hear your radio station on my telephone. His response would be, we can only charge for music on hold, so you should be happy. People would hang <laughs> up and never call back. Oh, gee. I kid you not. I, I, I used that line, I think, twice in my career when I worked at an AM station where we had a similar situation. I told a person on the phone, well, we normally charge for music on hold. You should be happy. And the woman goes, oh, click. That was it. So, th that's the kind of guy he was. Uh, so this past uh, October 11th, this past Friday, he uh, passed away in Plano, Texas. So I just wanted to put that out there because today, while I was at the AES show, uh, a lot of folks were coming up to me and asking me if I'd heard what happened and who was, what was going on, anybody know anything, so I just want to put that out there. Not to start now, things off on a, on a somber note, but, you know, anyone who knew Doc, trust me, this is the way he'd want it. <laughs> who, and you know, pardon me if this wasn't Doc Masumian, but I, I'm associating his name with, what, was it him or someone else who did the uh, Kodak cascading experiments? That would be um, his assistant at the time, Herb Squire. Oh, Herb Squire did that. Okay, Herb but, that, Squire, but, but I know but I Doc, heard, yeah. yeah, Doc was the motivating, part of the motivation behind that. And uh, let's just say if he was in the audience, he was definitely the heckler that would get you know, Herb going. <laughs> 
Well, that's how it works. But yes, it's term Sumian is such an unusual name that you know you hear that name a couple of times and you don't forget it. So I never yeah, got yeah. to meet Doc, but uh, sure have heard his name for my goodness, probably twenty five or thirty years now. Yeah, no, Doc was the kind of guy when he was selling broadcast equipment. Uh, the funny thing was his region was the Southwest. He lived in Plano. He retired there, but. All the New Yorkers and, and Boston and, and um, folks up north in New York State would only deal with Doc. So he uh, had only one region that was outside of his area. That was the New York metro area. And <laughs> nobody ever challenged it when he worked for Harris the same way. It was like, well, so-and-so covers that area. Yeah, no, it's okay. Uh, give it to Doc. That'll be <laughs> you can, you can well, buy through Doc. I must say, Godspeed God speed to Doc Masumian and uh, wherever he is. I, I hope he's well and uh, looking down upon us. So, uh, oh, good name. I, I'm, I'm afraid I, I never met him, but boy, that'd be good too. So, Chris, um, a lot of things, several things going on. AES, the convention in New York, is just starting. Want to hear a bit about that? Uh, also, I thought we'd take a few minutes today to, to do a little tutorial on the show. And uh, some folks may think this is boring. Other folks, uh, hopefully, you'll say, you know, I've never, not sure how that actually is done right. Um, I'm not saying I'd necessarily do it right, but however I do it seems to work uh, every time. And that is putting, putting RJ45 connectors like this onto a Cat5 cable and doing it correctly so that it works and stays working and keeps working. And thank goodness, to my knowledge, I've never had to redo one except when this little thing here, the clip, breaks off. And to solve that, we have, we have these... Uh, these little backs that you put on and like this, and they kind of cover the end of the clip. Some people, I don't, I don't know, I got this. The, the, a friend of mine always calls that little clip right there, right on the top. He always calls that the titty. He said, well, the little titty broke off. And if the little titty breaks off, then the, then the plug won't stay in the socket. So we're going to put two of these on the night and test them with a tester that I have right here behind me. So, yes, it's a how-to episode, how to Cat 5, how to Cat 6. And we'll, uh, we'll do that. Uh, we'll also talk to Andrew Zarian, the producer of the show, about his uh, basically one-year-old um, Axia Radius audio console. See how that's going and you know, what he's experienced with it. And um, um, there you go. That's, that's what we'll talk about. Our show is brought to you by the folks at Axia and, uh, coincidentally, the Radius audio console. If you need a console... Well, check it out if you would. Folks have been asking in the IAIB forums, this is the uh, International Association of Internet Broadcasters, uh, asking about, hey, what's this IP audio? Does it work? Uh, is, it, is it cheap enough yet? Uh, well, as far as we know, the Radius console is the lowest price IP, uh, IP audio console out there. So we'll talk more about that during, during our break. Uh, Chris, why don't you fill us in briefly on uh, AES? What, what, are, what are you anticipating? And uh, who'd you see today? And, and then we're going to jump right into the tutorial after that. Okay. Well, um, today, AES this, this year has a lot of great stuff. So in the realm of broadcasting, the sessions are broadcast streaming media. And uh, today there was loudness uh, for radio and internet streaming, which was actually pretty cool. Uh, some people we might be familiar with, names uh, by the name of Fody, Keen, and Lund, and Orban were there. That's Frank Fody, and Thomas Lund from TC Electronics, and uh, Bob Orban. And it was an interesting uh, conversation talking about basically loudness wars. Those of us who have been involved in that all know the well, how well that goes. And also today was uh, listener fatigue and retention. And uh, we had Greg Ognowski, also a guest on the show, uh, from Orban speak, as well as Frank Fotai again. And um, it, was, it was good. It was good stuff. So the, the, the topics today and tomorrow and throughout the weekend, let's see, uh, audio for 4K television was on today. That was actually uh, interesting. Tim Carroll was on the panel there with, along with uh, Bob Orban again. And I uh, noticed there's a pattern here when it comes to audio and who's the uh, experts they call on, or at least the high-profile people. And uh, also, let's see, throughout the weekend, you have modern audio transportation techniques for remote broadcasts. Oh, yes, I'm, I'm on that panel with Chris Crump of uh -huh. Comrex, so I believe, I believe we have him scheduled at some point later in the month, right? Uh, yes, Chris Crump is going to be on, uh, yeah. on Halloween. By the way, uh, program note, on Halloween, which is uh, not next week, but the next Thursday, our show is going to be uh, earlier in the day. I forget exactly what time. It's uh, uh, 2 o'clock or 3 o'clock Eastern time. Maybe, uh, yeah. Anyway, it'll be, it'll be an afternoon show uh, so we can all get ready to you know, go be spooks outside. And Chris Crump from Comrex has uh, agreed to be our guest, and I'm looking forward to having him. We've never had Chris on before, so he's a pretty cool guy and going to enjoy having him on. Yeah, that would be fun. 
And over the weekend, you have maintenance, repair, and troubleshooting. Uh, that'll be chaired by John Bissett from the TELUS Alliance. Uh, he has Bill Sachs and Kimberly Sachs and Michael Azaro from CBS. Bill and Kimberly are from Optimod. And they're talking about uh, audio equipment and the, uh, the consumer throwaway gear that we're all familiar with these days. And uh, they'll be talking about secrets of finding problems and fixing them and working to ensure that uh, things will work happily as you uh, go throughout the day with your equipment. That's just mm -hmm. to name a few things. That's in the broadcast streaming media sessions. There are plenty of other topics you can choose in sessions. Let me see. Uh, recording and production, applications and audio, audio processing, to name a few. And then there's, uh, there's a few that were just doozies. Uh, let's see. Yeah. End of line test concepts to achieve and maintain yield and quality in high volume loudspeaker production. Happen okay. That, 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 uh, just, you know, well, you know what? There's advances in impedance measurement of loudspeakers and headphones. Not many of us have to worry about those I, things. I thought when they, when, they, when they built a speaker and they're going to go to final test, I thought they just plugged into a real honking amplifier and play some Led Zeppelin through it and make sure it blows the hair. Isn't that what they That's did? it. That, that's the way it goes. I was at a couple of sessions today and the two, two or three doors down, uh, it was definitely music being played very loud to, to demonstrate something. I didn't, it was good music, <laughs> I but I didn't, get to, I didn't know what the topic was. And let's see. I just, have, see, uh, I just the, the, the final test tech you know, at the speaker company. Uh, hey, dude, man, I just tested like all 20 speakers, man. They're all just rocking. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Isn't and that the guy have, that tests um, speakers? Yeah, sorry, go ahead. And, and, if, and for some of the esoteric topics and, and uh, technologies and things that go on in the audio realm, remember, this is audio from all spectrums, not just broadcast. It's professional audio. It's uh, post-production, recording studios, you name it. So they have one on um, reverberation, dereverberation effect on Byzantine chants. That's right. Byzantine music is typically monophonic and is characterized by prolonged music phrases. Huh. So uh, they have a whole topic on Byzantine chants and reverberation and de-reverberation. De-reverberation. Wow. Not that wow. I've ever really heard the phrase or the word de-reverberation used in uh, audio applications, but that, this looks I, like a really cool one. Hey, I, I, I can't give anything away, but I got to tell you, there, there are audio scientists working on de-reverberation, including some who I know personally. And, uh -huh. uh, and yeah, yeah de-reverberation. There's, there's been a lot of work done on it. And uh, I don't know that there's been any, any br enormous breakthroughs that are, that are ready to make an, uh, you know, a, a life-changing product yet. But uh, believe me, there's research on it. It's, uh, it, it's, 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 it's cool. It's, it's difficult. And um, there's more work to be done on de-reverb. Okay, well, I'll, I'll look into that. And then in, the, in that particular topic, they have some folks from, uh, from Greece who will be uh, talking and uh, talking about these things. So it's, uh, it's going to oh. be interesting. It's, uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. And let's see, that's one of them. And there's an uh, artificial stereo extension based on hidden Markov model for incorporation of non-stationary energy trajectory. It sounds like something at a Defense Department meeting, but uh, I could be wrong. <laughs> it does, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> you know, but those are just some of the topics that are off out of left field that are actually pretty cool, and I've gone to a couple of them today. It was just, you know, when you, you, you sit there going, oh, okay, that stretches the memory a bit. It gets you thinking. And let's see. Oh, measuring speech intelligibility in noisy environments. We produced parametric spatial audio. That's pretty cool, actually. That would be cool. So as there's a lot of yeah. noisy environments in our world today. Um, and yeah. it seems like my wife's cell phone is always in one of them. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. And yeah. there's dealing with noise pollution in theaters. Well, I don't know if that just means the movie was bad or the movie was good. I don't know. Huh. I didn't know that was the problem, noise pollution in theaters. Yeah. Let's see. It says uh, video projection, moving lights, and automated scenery have become common in Broadway productions. Oh. Oh, that kind, that kind thinking, of theater. We're thinking theater. We're talking Broadway plays. Yeah, I was, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, the noise can create you know, it's become I, I, a problem for my, sound design. My wife and I were in New York a few weeks ago and we saw a, a Broadway production of Cinderella. And despite all the set changes and, and things moving on and off, I'm telling you, I didn't hear any noise pollution in there. Well, maybe the kids screaming a couple of rows of, in front of me. But other than that, uh, no, the, the, uh, I, I really didn't know that was a problem because, man, they, they, they had that thing down really well. It, you you oh, could hear yeah, most of it. You hear the actors fine. Also, there's a creative dimension of immersive sound. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah. The big topic this weekend is uh, immersive sound. Uh, in this case, it's sound in 3D, but it's all about creating that, I guess, 
uh, cinema effect. You know, when you're in a theater and you're, you're totally immersed in that movie and now trying to bring that out to the home. And I think MPEG H is where some of that's going uh, from the guys, huh. the folks at Fraunhofer. Yeah, now there's a whole new term, uh, audio, let me see if I get this right, audio objects. That audio objects are actually uh, soft points in the audio stream that can be used to tell the end device where to place this field, the sound field. Okay, so, okay. Yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. I was at a session with that today. Uh, it was <clears throat> pretty wild. So there's a lot of good stuff. So, you know, if you're in town and you're, you can make it, hop on the subway or railroad and come on over or drive through. Uh, if you haven't made time for it this year, uh, next year it's in L.A., Audio Engineering Society. Ah, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. By that. But yeah, I know some good stuff. It's going to be a busy weekend. Well, I, I sure plan to attend uh, next year. And I, I was there last year in, in um, San Francisco. Just missed it this year. All right. Um, what else? You want to jump to the tutorial? I'm, just, I'm itching yeah, to get this that. stuff off my desk. Okay. Hey, yeah. if, uh, Andrew, can you bring up this uh, wiring diagram I have? I'm sending you on the other feed. Yes. There we go. There is the ever popular wiring pattern uh, that is, if you're in IT and more and more, if you're in uh, radio engineering, that's the kind of cable you have to make if you're making cables. Now, I'll explain. We'll come back to that in a minute. Right now, let me show you something. All right, here is a pre-made cable. We're all familiar with pre-made cables. Throw that away. They almost always have a little twist tie. I always wonder if, if real Chinese people put these little twist ties on or if a machine did that. I don't know. So here's a typical patch cable. This one happens to be a one-meter patch cable. And I, I, I love these things. I use pre-made patch cables whenever I can to hook things up. Uh, this one's a Cat6 cable. You know, one you can, you can pretty easily tell the difference between Cat5 and Cat6 when you get to know what it feels like on the outside. Um, Cat6 cable is usually a bit thicker, and, uh, course, and it says Cat6 on the, on the side of it. Uh, and it's, it seems like it's, it's, uh, it's bumpier. The, the, the wires are maybe twisted a tad more. I don't know. Yeah, it's twisted uh, differently. There's a different twist. differently? Okay. Uh, Cat6, um, supposed to be good to, what, 350 megahertz? And definitely will work for gigabit connections? Yeah. Yep. And, and so th this is molded on. Th so this is a great way for the connector to be on. It's, it's molded. It's done for you. I'm sorry that's not focusing entirely on, on the connector. But, uh, you know, th this is the kind of connector that just seems to sit there and run and last. And I don't think I've ever bought one of these that was bad. Uh, I, I don't know how thoroughly they test these when they, you know, cost a dollar fifty a piece uh, from a shop in 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 China. But uh, I, I've had really, really, really good luck with this kind of cable. Now it's worth pointing out that a patch cable like this typically is made with uh, Cat five E or Cat six wire that is stranded, and so it's flexible. And so if you're going to run cable in any kind of a way where it needs to be flexed, it's not a permanent installation, then this is the kind of cable that you'd want to use. Uh, you'd want to use this cable to hook up to a piece of equipment that may come in or out of a rack. Any place where you're going to have to be moving it a bit, you want to use stranded cable. And there actually is a difference. The, the RJ connectors um, for Cat6, they're different than for Cat5. They should also include a little block of material in there. I'm not, I don't know if it's ferrite material or if it's just a black plastic to keep the the uh, the wires aligned. I'm I'm going to show you how to make it, how to put a terminate a cable, and I'm sure that what I'm showing you is not Cat6 compliant completely, but it does seem to work. So uh, in, in you know for gigabits situation. So anyway, there, there's your patch cable. Use a flexible cable, which patch cable should be um, uh, for anything that you're going to be moving around. Now, here I have some cable. Bought this for the house to install some security cameras and run stuff around. And this is actually outdoor rated cat. This is cat five or cat six. I forgot to take a look here. I thought it was cat six. Let's see if my old eyes can determine what that is. Can I read this? Uh, sorry to take up your time. That's cat five E. Okay. So this is Cat 5E rated for outdoor. I was wondering, what makes it rated for outdoor? Well, the, it, it, it feels heavy like Cat 6 cable. And by the way, all I need <clears throat> usually to get this done. Oh, you know what I forgot? No, I didn't. I think I got enough here. These two tools. I use a stripper like this. And there's all different kinds of wire strippers. I just happen to like this kind right here. I tend to be able to manipulate it pretty well. And a, an RJ crimper. And you want to, this does cost some money, an RJ crimper like this, but you don't want to get the plastic kind that they sell at Radio Shack for $7. 
You really want to get a metal one that 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 this one ratchets in. Let's see if you can hear that. There you go. And it, and it won't release until you've latched it all the way in, until you've crimped it all the way down. And it has sizes for the smaller RJ, whatever that is, 11 or 14 or whatever, and then the RJ11. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Then the RJ45 size. It also has a couple of cutters down here. It has one blade. It has two blades that come together that will strip the wire if you need that. They'll strip the individual wires if you need that, which I typically don't. And then it has a, a block cutter right below that that will actually cut the wires. So, and then it has a little ratcheting mechanism down here. If you get stuck, you can unstick it with that somehow. There you go. So anyway, so we're going to use that tool right there. Now, <laughs> let me show you the most important thing and the thing that I always forget. Do you know what that is, Chris? Will that be the hood? Yes, that's the hood. That's or the, the equivalent of an XLR connector's sleeve. Yes, the back of the XLR. That's what you want right there. That little plastic hood. Is that what it's called, a hood? I don't I'm know calling it a hood. Okay. Given the, way, the, the names of things you've said so far on the show, I'm not, uh, not going to go anywhere. You want to put that in first. Because if you forget it, then you can't put it on later. So there you go. Just do that. Get it on there. And you can pop it way back if you want to to have some more room to play with. Now, now in, uh, bear in mind, I know folks who ignore putting the hood on. They say, ah, you don't need it. That hood is what permits you to pull the cable through a bunch of other cables and obstructions. Yes. And the little tit, as you point out, doesn't get caught on things as you're pulling the cable. Actually, I, I was just doing some reading online. The thing that I was, that my friend, not me, my friend was calling a titty, uh, that's a tab. tab. Yes, it's a tab. The, a lot of people tab. call it what it's not. I, I couldn't think of the word tab. Okay, so Soft now drink. the next question is, how much wire do you strip off? Well, how many times have you come to an RJ connector where there were bare, not bare wires, but you know the jacket was hanging way back here? And there are some strandly little wires going up into the RJ. I've seen that so many times. It drives me nuts. I uh, walk around the Javits Center. You'll see that a lot today. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> but, but the other thing is you do have to strip off enough to where you can actually physically work with the wire. Because you're going to have to arrange these wires in a very difficult way. And, and so you, you've got to have an, enough out there to deal with. So I strip off a couple of inches of, of this stuff. Two and a half inches or so. So what I do is I take my stripper like this and i don't close it all the way down i don't have the right size here to be doing that this, this there's actually strippers made to do this and i don't have one of them so what i do you is score I just, the outer jacket i score it like that see and now you just break it open and voila and what are we left with oh not the wires because this is outdoor cable it has an extra an extra lining for protection so it has this extra white rubber lining in it so guess what i've got to strip that one off too just scored a little bit and, and yeah, just scored a little bit and uh, it's actually kind of tough. That's what makes this outdoor cable, I suppose. The squirrels and the chipmunks. That's for moisture to get to barrier it. and what else? There's a few things. Moisture yeah, bottle, I, get, I bet it is a moisture barrier. I should point out that typically the insulation that's on the conductors, on the wires themselves, is typically pretty soft. It's easy to nick. And so you want to try hard not to nick those that that those those uh, pieces of insulation now, there's also this little fiber here what is that chris this thing that comes along for the ride uh that one is you can pull that back that opens up the cable so you can strip it open the really yeah oh i thought i thought it was there for strength for pulling strength no you could no as far it. as i know that's huh? what i was told by several people at a couple of belden seminars oh well i've now, never there are found some cables you can buy that have a um There'll be a plastic piece in the center that's actually designed to keep the twist in proper place. But I believe yes, the, yeah, you kind can of actually, a, a, a cross shaped, yes, in, in cross yes. sections. It'll be and it'll it'll hold the four. Yeah, I thought the, that's cat. I think that's cat six, and that's that new building uh, twist they call it data twist. Yeah, I think it's called. yeah, media twist, media twist. That's it. Yeah. So what we end up with here is four pairs. <clears throat> now, this is interesting. These four pairs, I hope you can see that well enough. I wish I, maybe I should supply a dark background for you to see those on. There we go. There Excellent. You can see. So these wires, these pairs, each have a different twist per inch to them. They're not the same. It's a different twist per inch on each pair. And that is to help reduce crosstalk between the, 
the, between, between and among the pairs. Now, they're twisted to try to, uh, because, to, try to simulate over distance that they have the same axis. Um, and that way, the electrical fields create, generated by the uh, electricity going through them cancel each other out pretty well. So they each have a different twist. They're each twisted very well. And um, there you go. Now, in a 100 megabit connection, um, it's my understanding that only two of these pairs are used. I think, isn't it the orange-white pair and the, gr and the uh, green-white pair? I think that that's are correct. But you have to remember the Ethernet the, is an RF signal, and all the cables actually, actually interact with each other. Yeah, so if yeah. You choose, if you choose just to use two pairs of the four, yes, it may work, but if you try to do high, high data rates, you'll start to have issues. If you do a true test on the line with the, was it the next, next and best, no, uh, next, near, near, um, near, and cross near talk test, and yeah, near crosstalk, far crosstalk, it'll yeah. probably fail. Uh, now, sometimes, you know, I've bought some cheap, uh, like, Linksys uh, routers, and sometimes they'll come with a cable that actually only has two pairs in it. And, and if you look at the RJ connector, you can see only two of the four pairs actually go into the RJ connector and are hooked up. But they're intended for 10 megabit or 100 megabit. This is Cat 5e cable. It'll do gigabit. I, I don't know if it, if it always works on, on full-length runs, like 100 meters, but I've always had good luck with, uh, with uh, uh, Cat 5e for gigabit connections. Um, Cat 6, I'm sure, is what's called for and what's better. Um, Let's see. The other thing I would – what was I going to point out about this? I can't remember now. Okay. Well, first thing I do is untwist these. I untwist them all the way back to the jacket. Now, you're supposed to leave them twisted as far as possible until they have to straighten out for the connector. Uh, I have really poor luck if I you know, try to leave much at all twisted. Chris, you have a thought about twisting them all the way back to the jacket? Uh, untwist them back to the jacket? Uh, no, I have not. What I typically will do is – at about an eighth of an inch, an inch above the jacket, I put my thumb and index finger there, and then mm -hmm. I pull the others straight, straight out, line them up flat. Okay. And then I measure measure the distance <clears throat> that I want to cut, and then I just slide it into the, the connector. Now, that's an outdoor cable. Is that RJ connector designed for outdoor cable? Uh, actually, it, the, it does work. Uh, the, the jacket is a little, a little bit thicker, but the you know, when, you, when you crimp it, uh, uh, there's it a, inside, a rear thing inside here that... that yeah, it'll all fit inside there. Okay. Now, um, okay, for, next thing you got to do is line these up. Uh, Andrew, can you go back to that diagram that I'm sending you on the other system? There you go. So we've got to line these wires up to look like that. And that ain't necessarily easy to do. Uh, but once you get the, and, and you kind of get the, it's, it's, it's like anything that's very dexterous. You end up learning where do you need to apply a lot of pressure and pull and where do you need to be, uh, you know, use a gentle touch. Now, right now, um, we'll switch back to me real quick. Right now, I find the easy, easiest if I really flatten these things out. They have a, a still have a lot of twist in them, and and you can use all kinds of techniques to straighten them out, do this kind of thing too. But you really want them straight, and uh, you you might want the temperature of the insulation to be up a little bit by you know giving some friction there. So I kind of straight straighten them out. Now I got to put them in order. So the first one is uh, is the white orange pair, and I, I go from you know top to bottom on that. Uh, uh, on that diagram, this is how I, I memorized it. Uh, so first is the white orange pair, with the white being first. Then the green white pair, or the, the white green pair, is split. So the next wire to go next to the the, the orange white is the white green. So I got those two. I'll, I'll stop in a second and show you what I, what I got when I get uh, get to a good stopping point. Actually, why don't we stop right here? So I know this is back, probably backwards to the camera, but I've got three wires put together here now. The the uh, white orange, the orange white, and the white green wires. Now, next is remember the the white green pair was split. Um, next is the blue white pair, and it's it's in the it's the only pair that's in the opposite order um, with regard to the white as the others. So the the solid blue or the blue with the white stripe goes next, and then the white with the blue stripe goes after that. And then comes that solid green, or green with the white stripe, after that. And then comes the white-brown pair. Now, if you do this a few hundred times, you start to remember the, the sequence. But it seems like every time before I start a project, I've got to go find that diagram. I go to images.google.com and type in RJ45 and find me a diagram. 
Um, and so now, let me show this. I know that's backwards because I, I'm, I'm holding it up to where I can see it. But it is in order here. White, orange, orange, white, white, green, blue, white, white, blue, green, white, white, brown, and brown, white. Now, I've got them all flattened out really good here, as good as I can. And now these wires are way too long. Now, the, the mistake that so many people make is they put the RJ connector on right now. See? <laughs> I just put it right on there and have these all these wires. Well, we're going to cut those off. And we're going to cut them off. Uh, for me, it's about, you know, the thickness of my, of, if I grab my thumb right there, it's just about that. That's what's left over, and that's about right. So I'm just going to cut these off. They're going to go flying here. Do, 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 do. <laughs> one now, of those the way, blades on that, mm -hmm. oh, sorry, one of the blades on that cutter, um, I believe, at least the one I have, is uh, for flat Cat5. Ah, yes, that's the, the, where the two blades meet, but almost yes. meet. Yes, almost that meet, that's is, correct. That's for stripping satin cable. Satin cable, like, yeah. Right. Satin, yeah, like for you know, phone, phone connections. Well, they, they, actually, they actually, for a time, were making Cat5 cables that you could do that were flat. That, that still were flat, compliant. yeah. Yeah, you're right. Okay, so I just cut all those little ends off. And by the way, once you cut it down to this level, they're too short for you to go reorder the, to get them in the right order. They, you, you need to have them in the right order at this moment. Once you've cut these down to where they're, eh, at the most, a little over half an inch long, you can't go fix the order of those. So I'm holding them really firmly in place in the correct order. Visually check them one more time. White, orange, orange, white, white, blue. I'm sorry, white, green. And then blue, white, white, blue, green, white, white, brown, and brown, white. Now I'm going to shove them in here. Da-da-da-da. And I'm going to just let go and shove them in. And there are guides in the RJ connector that help guide each wire. So if, as long as you're holding them flat, they'll make their way into the right place. Now, it's certainly a good idea to visually look in there. And if you have to use uh, your old man reading glasses to, to make sure they're right, you know, do so. Uh, and then you see how the jacket, I've got the jacket partially pushed in there. I give it a good push. Get the jacket up in there. And on, now this is outdoor cable. It doesn't push as easily. On indoor cable, that jacket will slide right up in there another uh, half, uh, not half, uh, uh, maybe three sixteenths of an inch. Now I'm holding the RJ tightly, tightly up against the, uh, the cable. Now I'm going to put it into the crimper. Shove the, I'm holding the jacket of the cable, really shoving it in there and give it a good crimp. And there we go. It's done. I have crimped the jacket. The, 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 the clamp there has come down on the jacket, so it's being held by the, uh, the, you know, the jacket is being held in there, captivated. And when I crimped it, um, little blades on each of the copper, each of the eight copper uh, contacts went into the, uh, the insulation of the eight individual conductors. Now we can take the hood and put it on there, and we have a snag-free cable that we could pull backwards through a mess of wires, and it would uh, it would not snag. It's snagless. So what do you think? Do we do good? Looks good. All right. Now, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do the other one a little faster, and then we're going to put it in my cable tester. Where did my cable tester go? Ah, here it is. Just to show the cable tester works. See, th this is not an RF cable tester. This doesn't qualify the cable to be fabulous or not fabulous. This checks and makes sure that the conductors are all lined up correctly but it costs eight dollars i think i got this from ebay it's made by pile and it's okay um what's kind of neat about it you you plug the cable into this guy and then you plug the other end into this guy and you turn it on and this re incredibly stupidly bright light comes on and then it just starts it starts scanning through you see the green 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 you should see eight greens in a row now, what this is indicating on this particular model, it means that the connections at the other end are proper when it scans eight green lights all in a row. Now, what if you if had a crossover cable and testing it? What would the display it, be? If you had a proper crossover, I'm not sure. Well, I, I know that the, the green lights would not be in order. They would jump around some different order. In fact, 
Here's the other end, and it's also scanning. It shows them. I actually made a cable here at the house a couple days ago, and I did miswire it. I flipped around um, the uh, blue and the green white, and so I had a split pair. Well, this thing found it, but it found it by going by showing me one. It, it jumped one, two, four, three, five, six, seven, eight. So it, the green lights did not flash in order, and they only did it at one end. It only showed it at the end of this thing, and that meant that the it was the other end that was miswired. So I had to. I typically I didn't read the directions for this thing before I started using it, and so I had to figure out what that meant. But it meant indeed it meant that the. Uh, the, the, it was miswired at the other end, farther away from from here. So, there you go. That's a that's a for. I mean, for eight dollars, goodness gracious, that's a uh, perfectly good deal. All right, so let's make the other end of this. Hey, Andrew, could you watch the chat room in case there's a a question, or maybe everybody's gone to sleep? So I'm gonna. Strip off the outer conductor here. It just breaks right off. And if we were using regular indoor cable, that's all the stripping we'd have to do. And and the out the outer conductor usually does the outer jacket usually does um, uh, break off pretty pretty easily there. If, if I score it and then break it and it breaks off. So there's the inner one gone. Here's this uh, thing that Chris calls a ripper a rip cord. And now it's gone. And so there we are with our conductors. And I'm going to real quickly put them. Uh, oh, yeah, got to untwist them first. This is the part that hurts my fingers. So all this untwisting. So there's the green-white pair untwisted. Now, somebody in the chat room may point out, Kirk's doing this wrong. There are several ways you can do it. <laughs> yeah. As long as you keep, as, as, uh, as we all know, if you are not aware of the name Steve Lampin, he will tell you that the closest you keep the twist to the connector, the better off you'll be, so... Yeah. You can manage the twist in the jacket to the edge of the connector. You'll be in good shape. And, and, and if I pulled this hood back, you'd see that they don't come untwisted. And, and I mean, the, I've shoved the jacket in so far up in there, that, which is where it should be, actually, that in, for all intents and purposes, I might could have gotten uh, half a twist out of each of those. But if I got half a twist, you know, it's just not worth it. I, I really uh, think I've done it as well as it can be done with regard to that. Yeah, no, that's good. Somebody in the chat room was talking about uh, gel-flooded cables. I don't believe that cable you have has got gel in it by chance. You know, that'd be pretty cool, and I have seen those, but no, this doesn't have any gel in it. But a real, you know, like an underwater or a waterproof cable would have yeah, that. The gel is, yeah, the gel cables typically used in uh, moisture environments. Phone companies used to use them a lot for uh, underground purposes, so they wouldn't have to evacuate with nitrogen. That gel tastes terrible, by the way. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's just—it's no fun to eat. Okay, now I'm—I know it's just hard to see, but I'm—I'm I'm trying to align these wires, and I need to—I need to go do this to it so I get them all nice and straight. You know, if one of them's got a, a good curve in it somewhere, then it doesn't want to behave with the others, and it's—it's it's hard to get them straight again. It takes now, this, practice. This, the solid brown one has gone and moved in here, so I've got to move this guy out. The solid brown is the last one um, on the right-hand side or on the bottom, whichever way you're looking at it, and. Almost done here. Let's see. Oh, this, oh the, the solid green is being ornery. So I've got to move the solid green around. This would be a whole lot easier if my eyes weren't 51 years old. You young guys haven't made. All right, let's put the solid green I've there. I've seen some of the cable connectors the young guys make, so I don't know. <laughs> well, this, th the thing is, this does matter. These aren't just, as you said earlier, this is, there's RF, there's radio frequency energy going through these wires. It's a high frequency. It's in the, it's in the 100 megahertz to 350 megahertz range. And it's, these have to be right. Otherwise, they absolutely, the performance won't be good. And I will tell you, and I will not name the location this was done at, but I will tell you that I worked at a facility that was uh, rebuilt. And it was all based on Cat5 cabling for a lot of the servers and audio and everything else. And because of some of the, I guess the junctions, uh, maybe the cross connects that were mm -hmm. being employed were not properly uh, uh, terminated with the twists in place. Believe it or not, the standing waves on the length of Ethernet cables burned the switch ports. You open up the switch and you can see burn marks at the bottoms on the switches, the Ethernet switches. Wow. Because, the, because of the standing waves, the high-speed data and... 
I was I was taken back. I was like, what? Because we were talking to a company regarding one of the data issues, and the guy said, look, the problem has to be at, at your cabling because according to what we can see on the data stream, the measurements we're making, something is wrong with your cabling. We're like, no, it's it's all Cat Five certified. Blah 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 blah. Sure enough, we had somebody come in to do a qualifier, and about 50% of the cables failed, and it turned out that they were these little couplings that were designed, some kind of printed circuit board coupling that did not maintain the twists between the two connectors ah. on the PC board. And and when and you said qualified, when you said qualified, they weren't using a cheap conductive only tester. Oh no, no, like no. This. It was a fluke, it was a fluke tester. Yep. Uh, yep. one I've used in the past that will actually uh, Display the the you know the wiring path, the uh, far end, near end, cable length, and it'll do the complete test and tell you if it's passes or fail. You could do VoIP, you could do uh, thousand megabit, you know, the whole bit, you know, one gig, the whole nine yards. And uh, we were like, what? And sure enough, one of the Ethernet switches we opened up, and uh, you can see the discoloration at the connector. Wow. Uh, so I, I talked to a guy at uh, at the time. This was uh, Nortel, so it was Nortel switches, which were formerly Bay Networks. And uh, talked to one of the application engineers, and he said, "Oh yeah, yeah, you got a really bad installation, and you got standing waves on that wire, and the data is running. But eventually, it just burns the bottom. It, it just can't wow. handle it." Like, so I talked to Steve uh, Lampin about it, and yeah. he laughed. He's like, "Oh yeah," he goes, "People have no idea what they're doing to their switches when they don't do the cabling right." <laughs> wow, wow, that's you good know, to know. Steve, and, 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 you know and, how you know, Steve is when he says these things. Yeah. <laughs> If if we were running little radio transmitters and we knew the impedances weren't right and there were standing waves, that's what would happen. We'd have nodes of high voltage and it could break down the insulation of the wire carrying it. So well, sure, I, that, I, um, I in, in in early days of experimenting working with uh, FM transmitters and low power transmitters and antenna design, a friend of mine and I built a small directional antenna for an FM. We were just trying out some ideas and. Uh, we discovered that we had a mismatch, the impedance mismatch at the antenna base. Uh, it was not properly matching the cable length. Uh, it was about 150 feet of cable. Uh, I, not RG8, it was the, uh, what was that other one, the 9913 or something. Double, double shielded a whole bit. And we observed, and we're running about 250 watts, and it was at 98 megahertz, so it was about dead center of the dial. And mm -hmm. the cable, every wavelength was hot, cold, hot, cold because yeah. of the mismatch. And we sat there, and we like, this is so cool. Now, granted, we were like, you know, it's the worst thing you could have, but we actually, you know, you read theory, and now we're actually finding this out in practice. And by using that, the heat, we could, we tune the bollum to get rid of the standing waves. Ah, yes, <laughs> yes. As, yes, as a goof. Yes. I mean, we had a, we had a SWR meter we could, you know, sure, measure it sure. and everything else. But we said, you know what, let's get real crazy with this experiment. And sure enough, as we tuned closer to proper match, the heat dissipated and the, the cable yeah. just was warm. Ethernet's the same way I've been told, and, I, and you read about it. So you, those connectors have to be treated like an RF connection, like a BNC or an N connector. So uh, working with this cable, I was really having trouble with the, with the solid green connector, uh, the wire. It needs to go between the white blue and the white brown. But I had to really fiddle with it for a while to get it to behave. It kept wanting to encroach in between the, the, the blue-white and the white-blue pair. But I've got when it I good. Sorry, What? I was just say what I sometimes do when you have it that way, when you have them flat, or you're trying mm -hmm. to get them to be flatter, I will take my fi index finger and thumb and just like uh, up and down twisting them, like pushing them, and that sort of yeah. like, flattens them out a little more, and you can manage that. The brown and the green are the ones that always are nasty. Uh, they always flip in the wrong place. By the way, I'll bet you people who do this for a living, I bet they got tools to make this much easier. But this is what you know we broadcast engineers are doing. I bet there's yeah, tools out there that, that I don't know about. All right, here we go. We're gonna cut this one off. All right, now they're cut off, and without letting go of this, because it'll surely mess up if I do, I'm going to dump it right here into the connector, push them on home, and there we go. And I got to crimp that. I got to crimp that, but uh, man, I wish that camera would focus closer. All right, so I'll put it in the crimper, and push it. I'm pushing the outer in really hard so it gets in there and gets crimped. And guess what we forgot to do? The hood. The hood. We didn't put the back on. This is not a snag-free cable now. Are, are, there, are there people in the chat room who are saying, I knew it! I had been telling you! Andrew's supposed to be watching the chat room for us. I don't know if he is or not. I'm looking at it. I, no, he, nobody's talking about the hood at the moment. You can't put this on now. You can't do it. Um, so, just in case um, such a thing happened... Oh, somebody did put in the word boot. 
boot. A boot. That's the right word, isn't it? Put the boot das in boot. there. <laughs> I, I, okay, so you know, I'm going to do the right thing. I'm, I'm not going to let that lay around. I'm going to cut it off and start over again. And this time I'm going to do it a little more quickly so we don't have to sit all the way through it. So there, there we break off the outer conductor. There's the, the rubber that's left. You won't have that in indoor cable. Only no, an outdoor. You could, chat room was saying now you can make two shorter cables. Oh, you, you, you really ought to put the boot on before you even start this process. So before I go one little bit further, there's the boot. You should put the boot on before you even start. It's the first thing you should do. Gosh, I can't believe I did that. I, I did that once this past weekend. We're going to talk about that. I moved my radio station in Mississippi, my well, the one in Cleveland, Mississippi, this weekend, and I had to make up a few cables. A couple of people in the chat room are saying it's not worth the hassle of time making Ethernet cables, and you're absolutely right. But sometimes you just have to do it yourself. You know what? They are. Th th it's a very good point. It's not worth that. If if you can plan ahead and buy what you need, especially buy them from Mono Price or some other place where they're you know a dollar, two dollars, five dollars, affordable. Not stupid, you know, fifteen ninety five. Don't buy them at Staples or Best Buy. Goodness gracious, pay all kinds of money there. Um, you buy them at a wholesale price, then yeah, yeah. Uh, don't make up your own cables. And and yeah, and, 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 it, and it depends it, on the installation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in, in this radio station, we there's no need for us to have a structured cabling system, so we don't have uh, you know RJ forty five patch bays. Uh, we just wire everything direct, direct to where it needs to go, and it, it's such a small installation, and that that's what works out for us. But if you're, yeah, yeah, just buy them whenever you, whenever you possibly can. All right, there's the orange white, there's the uh, wh uh, white green, and there's the blue and the blue white, and there's the green and white, and then there's the white brown and the brown. So I'm going to put them all together preliminarily in order, flatten them all out nice and good. I know we're spending a lot of time on this, but you know what? If you learn to do this right, it's a, if you do it wrong, stuff doesn't work. Like what I experienced, I was hooking up a, a high-power Wi-Fi access point here in the house, and I had that, that cable split. And you know what? It didn't work. It didn't work at all. I hope it wasn't PoE. Actually, it was PoE, but nothing Ooh. got hurt in the process. It, it's oh, a, good. it's, yeah, it's one of my first PoE devices in the house besides these phones back here. The so high so. power is a thousand milliwatts or a five hundred milliwatt uh, RF. Um, it'll do like a minus nineteen dBm output. I'm not I sure what that, that is in, term, that in terms of milliwatts. Let me double check here. White, orange, orange, white. And then comes, um, indeed, ah, there it is, white, green, blue, white, white, blue, green, white, white, brown, and brown, white. And I'm going to slide them. I know you can't see this, but if you just get them all in, slide them all in, they go in the right spots. Shove that outer conductor on in there, push it in hard so it'll grab right there and crimp and put the boot on. And now we're going to, now the moment of truth. Can Kirk make a cable as good as a pre-made cable? Well, we'll find out. Here's uh, one end of this. Click it in. Live TV, folks. A lot can go wrong. Here's the other end. And uh, just so for your pleasure, I'll just uh, stick these together and turn it on. Nothing. Oh, wait a minute. Got to plug that in. There we go. <laughs> Didn't have it plugged all the way in. <laughs> Uh, whoops, there we go. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And I think you can put this in a slower mode. I'm not sure if it tests more thoroughly, but it certainly goes a bit more slowly. One, two, three, four, five, seven, eight. So and if they the, were... DNCs for ThinNet? Yeah. Yeah. I haven't tried it with that yet. Um, Anybody still using ThinNet? <laughs> I don't know. It says it works with... 10 base T, token ring. Yeah, token um, ring, that's right. TPPMD. Don't know what that is. Also, EIA TIA 568A and 568B. We've been wiring to 568B. Uh, if you, yeah. Andrew, if you throw that uh, picture up again, uh, you see it says wiring pattern T568B. And that's, that's what everybody uses nowadays. I've 
somebody in the chat room probably knows why A was used for a while and then it got switched to B and when they were appropriate. It had to do with old phone wiring standards. Yes, it and, did. Uh, yeah. And Europe had for a while standardized on the uh, 568A, I think it was. Of course. It's t different. So I have made us the cable. And how I don't even know how long it is. It looks like it's about nine feet. Let's see. There's six. That's about eight, about eight feet long. About an eight-foot cable. Good. Very good. So now we know how to do that. We'll refer people back to this episode if you need to know how to make a, a cable. I bet there's videos on YouTube that show that even better than I did it. There you go. All right. Hey, folks, our show is brought to you by, it's This Week in Radio Tech, our show is brought to you by Axia and the Axia Radius audio console. I think uh, Andrew Zarian is going to show us his Axia Radius console that he's got. There's Andrew there go. and his Axia Radius. You know, one of the things that I, I, I like about when, when a podcaster, when a radio station puts an Axia console in, they stop having mixed minus problems. Mix minus problems just go away because the console does automatic mix minus. The operator can't mess it up. There's nothing for the operator to mess up. If the engineer just programs it correctly, which is easy to do, you, you, you pick the type of source that it is, and you wire it up, and you're always fed mix minus. Chris Tobin, uh, you're not hearing yourself back over your connection, are you? Not at all, no. Mix minus and is I'm not hearing very well. Yeah, I hear everything but me over my over my Skype connection to uh, to the GFQ network, and same thing for you, and same thing when Chris Tarr is on the show, or when David B. Alec or any other guest is on the show with us, they hear everything except themselves, and that's what you want because if you hear yourself back delayed, it's crazy. You can't deal with it. Well, that's what Mix Minus does for you, and the uh, all the Axia consoles do an automatic mix minus. Now, uh, Andrew, that console there, how many faders is that? Is it eight? I'm counting. I believe it's eight. And the other, the other, now that the thing we're looking at there, the thing that everybody calls the console is really a surface. It's a control surface with lights and buttons and faders. What does it connect to? Is there any way you can show us that? Uh, the, you mean the back of it? No, the, 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 the thing in the rack. Oh, th I can't reach it. Oh, you can't reach it. No. Okay. Oh, I, th I thought earlier you, you had swung your camera. No, it, it's kind of locked in. If I pull this, it's going to all come apart. Don't worry about it. So the, the radius connects via a CAN bus cable, which looks like we're using what looks like a heavy-duty uh, cat, cat I cable. I don't know if you guys could see that. Oh, there my arm is blocking it. There we go. So, so anyway, one cable connects it over to the engine, and the engine has all the smarts, and the, uh, the uh, Ethernet switch is built in to the engine, so it, it provides PoE, power over Ethernet. So if you want to hook a Telos phone system to it, you plug it right in. It even powers the phones. You can hook it up to uh, an Ethernet switch if you need to, another one, and, you know, to hook several rooms together. It has, uh, that engine has local audio I.O., so it's got analog inputs, analog outputs. It has a couple of AES digital inputs and outputs. Um, it, has a couple of, it has four microphone-level inputs as well. And uh, then it also has the Ethernet switch built in, so you can tie it to other Ethernet devices. Uh, things like in, in Andrew's studio, um, he can feed the, uh, the Omnia One audio processor over Ethernet. It becomes a, a live wire source and destination. doesn't have to run other cables to it. Now, Andrew's using some outboard mic processors because he likes that mic processing. And uh, so those, the output of those mic processors go and, and feed uh, some of the analog inputs uh, on, the, on the engine. Um, the engine has all the memory in it to, to hold several profiles for the console. So let's say if, if Andrew does some shows that are all in studio and other shows that are all Skype people, he could, if he wants to, he can make two different profiles, one for in studio, one for Skype. And I think Andrew just wanted to go ahead and just do them, you know, do them separately, set them up manually, which is not hard to do at all. Uh, but you can have different profiles to handle different uh, show situations. Maybe you have a radio station and you do music most of the of the time, but on the weekends, maybe you do a big football game. Uh, so you can easily just hit a button, the console reconfigures itself for that football game. Um, uh, so many possibilities. The, the meters on that thing are gorgeous. You can see how bright they are. They're these bright LED meters. There's a clock and a timer built on the console. And by the way, all the, the, the faders and, the, uh, and the, the volume controls for the headphones and speakers, those are uh, either optical in the, in the in, in the case of the, the rotary ones, or on the, the, the up and down linear faders, no audio actually goes through those. They actually just create a digital signal 
that controls the DSP circuitry back in, in the engine. So you don't have any crackling. You don't have noise on the faders. You never have to clean a fader. If you ever, if you ever spill something in there, you can take it apart and clean it, and we actually have a kit to help you do that. Uh, but uh, you're never going to get crackling on, on the faders. In fact, the engineers at, at, uh, at Axia years ago came up with this incredible algorithm that does away with a number of problems that other consoles have with regard to linear faders and having what we call a zipper problem. You don't have a zipper problem uh, with, uh, with Axia consoles. Uh, that console there is, I think it's very inexpensive for a full-featured uh, professional console. Uh, no, it's not a Mackie. No, it's not a Behringer. Uh, but I think it's on the order of uh, about a $6,000 console uh, for the, uh, the, the Axia Radius console. Check it out on the web at axiaaudio.com. Axiaaudio.com. It's IP audio and um, connects very easily up with literally many, many dozens of other live wire connected devices like Telos phone systems or uh, Omnia audio processors or other audio consoles from, from Axia. All right. Thanks a lot, Axia, for, uh, for uh, sponsoring uh, This Week in Radio Tech. Well, guys, we've got a few minutes left. It's quarter after the hour. And, um, um, Andrew, thanks for showing off that, that studio. Oh, no Any problem. comments, Andrew, uh, about the console? You've used it for almost yeah. a year now. What are your thoughts? Uh, I'll tell you, when, when you came to set it up, I was terrified of this thing. <laughs> um, it was extremely intimidating at first for me, uh, not knowing how to do it because it was networking pretty much, right? Everything is, you got to kind of understand networking in order to understand this. But you told me something that stuck with me. You said, Everything that you think you got to do with this, you got to throw it out the window. You're now doing all digital. This is totally different. Uh, you don't have to worry about the mix minus not being leveled between you know each channel. And that alone changed everything for me. I recently had to go and set someone's studio up. And Kirk, I'll tell you, it was such a disaster to make all the mix minuses balance where at the, to the point that you're not overlapping. Like if we're doing a Skype call, even though I have a, you know, I'm using aux sends and I have technically have a mix minus, you may be coming in hot to me and I may be going hot to you. Yeah. And only way to do that is by, you know, playing around with each setting for sitting there for a couple hours and fine tuning everything. With this, you don't have to worry about that. Yeah. There, there, you said fine tuning. There is no fine tuning. You set stuff up and the levels are right and the, the routing is correct. And if it's not correct, it's because you didn't set something up right. And I got to tell you, setting up that radius console, it, it it's like it's like buying an, an airline ticket. You know, you, you select your route and what kind of seats you want and the day you want to go and the time you want to go. If you can buy an airline ticket, then I'm look. I'm not saying it's it's uh it's not as easy as as you know playing uh, solitaire maybe on, on a on, on a PC. Uh, but it does it it's it's pretty intuitive. So if you can buy an airline ticket. You can set up a radius console. Kirk, also, uh, another pro, no ground loops. Oh, yeah, yeah. On the Skype lines. Uh, before, we had awful ground loop issues with the Skype lines. And we've used, you know, the ground loop isolators and all that. But it wouldn't really fix a lot, a lot of the problem. It was still there. I could take this up and pot it up all the way. There's no ground loop. Yep. Because yep. we're using because the, IP the, audio. The audio. The audio is digital, and it's coming in over Ethernet. And Ethernet... We just put some connectors together here, right? Ethernet is inherently balanced. That's what it's about. It's balanced. And that means that if you've got a grounding problem in one room and, not a, and, and another problem in another room, the Ethernet doesn't care. The first thing Ethernet hits when it goes into a computer or a, a device that has an Ethernet jack on it, the first thing that it hits is what, uh, what Chris referred to as a balun. Uh, and typically, this is a, a transformer. It's a T-tiny, tiny little transformer, but the conductors, the pairs, go into transformers. And that takes care of ground loops right there. By the way, uh, Ethernet also works well in high RF environments. Now, I'm not saying that we've, we've experienced every possibility, and if you've got a high RF environment, maybe you should use shielded cable. But, um, hey, I've, I've been involved with the installation of uh, an Axia Livewire network at a location that had two high-power AM transmitters. They had had RF problems out the yin-yang for years and just couldn't get rid of it. And Axia, the Livewire, just solved the problem. No, no RF problems anymore at all. Went away. I absolutely love it, Kirk. I, I can't ever go back. You know what they say, it. once you go <laughs> digital, you don't go back. Is that what they say? That is, is that what they is? say. <laughs> Hey, That's what we're going to wrap in Queens. <laughs> That's the, yeah. Well, it's a whole different saying here, but. 
Hey, uh, uh, I want to hit on one more thing uh, before we run out of time. Uh, this past weekend, I moved a radio station. I'm sorry I don't have uh, pictures to, uh, to be showing you. I don't, at least I don't think I do. Maybe I do. Hang on just a second. Uh, I should have. I'm sorry. I should have. Um, da, 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 da. I should have had this ready to go while I was yapping, and I just didn't do it. How do I go get to my app here? Uh, how about we go there, and in just a minute there, Mister uh, Zarian. I'm going to see if I can have you bring this up. See if any of these photos uploaded automatically, like they were supposed to. Come on, come on. Let's see. Do, 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 do. Well, we sure didn't get much in the way of uh, pictures. I got a lot on the 35 millimeter camera, but not so many on the this one. Satellite that you spoke of moving was it C band or KU? Yeah, it was. Uh, it was uh, C band. Let me let me see. Did you have a wire got, mesh I, TVRO I, type of uh, downlink, or did you have a solid dish? What we had. I'm just uh, yeah I, I got I got I got nothing here I got nothing helpful all right um, we had to move the C band dish and you know uh, look I, I know in, in plenty of broadcasters have bigger dishes than this this is one of those DH brand spun aluminum dishes it's a solid aluminum dish the dish itself not so heavy it is big I want to say it was uh, three point two or three point three meters so it's it, you yeah, know it's good the C band that's 12, what you want yeah yeah good twelve feet across here's the problem. At the old location, at the old studio we were at, the dish was on a pole that was 23 feet tall. Oops. We had, we had no, no property upon which to set the dish at our old location. The roof, we couldn't mount anything on the roof. It was a, a pitched roof, and we would have had to do a lot of engineering to bolt something to the roof. So the best solution was to get this freaking eight-inch Schedule 40 pipe, put a we uh, year five years ago, we welded a big uh, plate to the bottom of it with gussets on it. We ran that up the we, we we put that in bolts and concrete in the ground. We ran that up the side of the building, and just at the top of the building, we we put a uh, uh, a, 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 a mount there that held it to the top of the building. So now it's held at the bottom, held at the top of the building, and then extended up about four more feet above that. It reduced to a five inch inside diameter, five and a half inch OD. Uh, Schedule 40 pipe, and that's where the sleeve of the uh, satellite dish mount went over. So this thing is 23 feet up in the air. And uh, we had some difficulty locating the right piece of equipment to help us snatch it off of there. We ended up getting um, what's often referred to uh, a, a SkyTrack brand, uh, four-wheel drive, fully articulating lift. Yeah. Now, the Sky one we got hold of... Some places. Sky Genie, yeah. Uh, uh, some in some places they're called a Pettibone because Pettibone yes. is a is a brand name that that makes this uh, this, this sort of thing. Ours didn't have a, a nice platform to stand on. It only had forklifts, so forks. So we had to put a pallet on the forks, and we stood on the pallet. So we we got up there and we realized, you know what? It's not reasonable for two men to stand on this pallet and try to lift this dish off and manhandle it down. Uh uh so what we did was we went up there, up to you know, 23 feet up, loosened all the bolts, made sure that the thing would, would twist, and then we got a really strong strap and hooked it to the forks, raised it on up higher, hooked it to a good strong point on the, the satellite dish mount. Now remember, the dish itself is kind of fragile. It's, it's just fairly thin aluminum. Uh, and, but the mount was really heavy duty. So then we got off of the lift and, and on the roof, we kind of wiggled the dish back and forth while we were, you know, applying upward pressure from the forks and the and the strap, and uh, and and you know, within a few minutes, had it jiggled off of the, the the pole and had it free. Very carefully, took it down to the ground and put it and loaded it onto a, a flatbed trailer. Um, at the new site, it was a lot easier. Uh, two days before, we had dug a hole. It turned out to be way too big. Two yards of concrete didn't quite fill the hole up. That was two and a half yards. Two and a half yards didn't quite fill the hole up. It dug a big hole. And we had a big uh, five-inch Schedule 40 pipe already in the hole. Uh, and so then we just had to figure out how to manhandle the thing up onto the top of this pole. Got it done. And I must say, aiming the thing was pretty easy. We had an, uh, an XDS um, satellite receiver and pretty well knew. I mean, we already had the elevation set. We didn't mess with the elevation on the mount. 
So we pretty much had to swing it back and forth, tweak that up. We, we tweaked the elevation to make sure that was good. Got about a, a 13 uh, dB EBNO, EB That's over good. noise signal. Yeah, That's good. Thir- 13. Uh, and yeah, uh, locked it down. EBNO stayed the same and ran the, the, uh, the uh, RG6 inside and bam, we got uh, satellites to two different receivers. What's, so, the, what's the look angle at that location? To that, was it AMC 8 you're looking at? Yeah, I'm going to guess in, in the southern Mississippi, the look angle, I mean, it, it's not terribly low. It's probably, if I had to guess, um, 19, 20, 21 degrees, something oh, like that. That's nice. If here, I had to here guess, yeah. York, here in New York, it's nine degrees off the horizon. You're looking I over. Can't looking tell over you, yeah. I can't tell you how many times we did uh, rooftop uh, installations and we're shooting across. It's like, I can't believe we're getting a signal. Yeah. For those of you who yeah. don't, those of you who may not be familiar with this, the satellite that Kirk's radio station is looking at is uh, AMC-8. It hovers in the arc of satellites over just about between uh, California and Hawaii. And that's it's the second from last satellite in the arc of satellites to go around the equator. So if you can picture trying to draw a line from, say, New York City to that antenna, that satellite, it's about nine degrees off the horizon. So yep. for you, yep. Kirk, you had uh, 19 or 20. That's even better. Now, now it, it is 22,000 miles above the surface of the Earth, right? So oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's what the, if if it if, if it's happened that the orbital arc was smaller, um, you know, due to gravitation or, or whatever, well, we'd all weigh less, I suppose. But um, uh, yeah, n- n- that that's where it's parked. It has to be there to be geosynchronous, so it sp- goes around yes. the Earth. It orbits at exactly the same rate that the Earth orbits, so it always appears to be at the same point in the sky. And, and you uh, know what the uh, funny thing is with that that whole principle uh, that <laughs> that. Geosynchronous position is, is about a hundred and fifty mile square box, and the satellite actually does about a figure eight rotation. I've in, heard that. that. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's where that phrase still, "center of the box" comes from. Yeah, the center of the box. Yeah, is where the, yeah. the figure eight crosses. The, you know, the infinity symbol crosses. Huh? Um, huh? It's just it's just that when you start reading into the science behind satellites and how they work and what they do, you start to appreciate the technology. And go, whoa, okay. <laughs> it's like looking for a needle in a haystack. <laughs> But 22,000 yeah. miles is exactly what the satellite is. And, and uh, if you're wondering, when the satellite does fail at end of life, no, nobody goes up and grabs it. It is actually pushed into an orbit that the Earth has, a magnetic orbit that just is with the graveyard, with satellites just sit and rotate and go nowhere. Huh. Yes. So they, they, they don't even send them to, to burn up in the atmosphere and come oh, on Oh, no, 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 no. That's, that's like an international treaty violation. No, you don't do that. Oh. Oh. Because you can't guarantee that it, all of it will be uh, destroyed. That's true. So uh, that's true. yeah. So no, it gets pushed into the graveyard, which is a uh, it's a it's a dead zone of the magnetic fields, and they just push it. It's they push it off off orbit, and then slowly it moves into this position. It's a natural thing; it just sits there, and that's where all the satellites just hang out. They just sit there and, and float. <laughs> it's I a dead a satellite and, graveyard. Yeah, I had a chance to sit and talk with a, a true rocket scientist, a guy who whose job was to uh, they call fly the spacecraft from an Earth station, uh, GE yeah. Maricom. And uh, when wow. he told me how it worked and all the magnetics involved, I'm like, whoa, this is, this is good stuff. <laughs> so I just thought cool. I'd add that to your, uh, your, your fun, uh, fun move of just a simple, what appeared to be a simple metal dish on a rooftop to a new stationary position. Um, the, the other difficult thing about the move was I had to, um, uh, luckily I didn't have to take it down. Uh, we had a spare Scala brand, uh, I guess now Catherine, but a Scala brand paraflector for our 950 megahertz STL shot. Um, our STL shot a- ends up being about three miles shorter than it used to be. Uh, we only, I only had to get the dish up about, uh, the antenna up about 38 feet above the ground, which is all I felt comfortable anyway with this particular self-supporting antenna, a self-supporting uh, tower that's at the new site. The, 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 the new building that we bought happened to be an old, an, a radio station 15 years ago. So uh, we were able to to move right in actually twenty years ago, but we moved right in to a place that used to be a radio station anyway. Um, so the tower was already there. Uh, I personally climbed the tower, put the paraflector up, uh, ran the uh, the half inch coax to it, uh, put new connectors on the half inch coax and such, uh, tied it off to the tower properly, and uh, so that was the kind of the heavy lifting. I, I got to tell you, moving th- th- now this studio you've maybe seen pictures of it before here on the show. This is an Axia studio. Uh, this is an old demo system that I bought from my employer uh, for literally pennies on the dollar. So it was nice that I got it. But it was an old, you know, beat up demo system, and it's a six fader, uh, six fader little element console 
and it's it's our separate system. So it's a separate mix engine, separate power supply, separate Ethernet switch, a couple of nodes, actually three nodes all together, one back in the tech center and two in the control room. And I got to tell you, that that move was just as easy as could be. That It was probably not an hour worth of reconnecting. And I think uh, a couple cables had bad tabs on the on them, so I had to go you know, make some new cables for that. Um, but that was the pleasurable part. That was really easy to, to move. Um, uh, we did have to rerun cables to people's, uh, headphone amps and, you know, jacks, uh, uh, but, you know, gosh, I'll tell you the moving, moving IP based stuff, studio gear, such a pleasure, really that easy to do. I, easier than, easier than rewiring a stereo system, honestly, it's just so easy. I miss those days of pulling 25-pair cable and Amphenol connectors and snapping them <laughs> into the side not. of a 66 block and then cross-connecting those wires to the inputs and outputs of a console. Uh, now, come on. You, you don't miss those days of building a harness on a wooden backboard and placed underneath the console so you're on your back trying to do punch cables, uh, punch, uh, how about, punch blocks? How about sitting on an upside-down five-gallon bucket for three days while you use a punch the punch down to punch blocks on a wall? Yes. No fun. Well, oh. Or you go back to the old days of Christmas tree blocks and soldering. Oh. Jeez, no, please, no. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Now, no. now the horror stories begin. Oh. All right. I think we're done. <laughs> Should we put a fork in this episode? Absolutely. All right. Hey, coming up on future episodes, we have uh, next week, Shane Toven, who is an engineer up in Wyoming. He climbs towers, goes to all kinds of mountaintop transmitter sites, and he has stories to tell and, and some things to tell us particularly. So Shane Toven... Fantastic contract engineer. I, I, actually, I think he works for maybe Wyoming Public Radio. I'm not sure. I don't know. Good guy. And then the week after that, on Halloween, well, our show will be at a special time, uh, sometime in the uh, afternoon. Uh, Andrew, do you have what time we agreed upon? <laughs> do you know? 2 p.m. Two o'clock, I thought. 2 Eastern. 2 o'clock okay, Eastern, Eastern, Eastern. 1 o'clock Central Time for This Week in Radio Tech on Halloween, October 31st. Our guest will be Chris Crump from Comrex, and he'll talk a bit about their audio stuff, which is cool, but he's also going to talk about their, their video uh, box that, that shoots video over, uh, over wireless That's a cool box. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of research has gone into, into their implementation. I applaud them for, uh, for doing all that. So that's coming up. Uh, thanks to Axia for sponsoring This Week in Radio Tech. Go to axiaaudio.com and check out the Radius console and be just like Andrew. Well, at least have the same console he does. Nobody can be like Andrew. <laughs> Take care, folks. Uh, Chris Tobin, thanks for being with us. I appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. Anytime. I have a good time with this. this all right. Fun. We'll see you next week, and uh, we'll see you next week on This Week in Radio Tech. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. That's all the bandwidth we can pill for this week. Another tort has propagated, and all the transmitters and audio equipment live happily ever after, thanks to the handsome engineer and his kind, benevolent care. We'll be back next week. Lord willing, and the creek don't rise. This week in Radio Tech. Subscribe to iTunes, and you'll never miss a show. Search for This Week in Radio Tech in the iTunes Store. Soliciting is strictly encouraged. If you like today's show, tell a friend. If you didn't like it, we were never here. Kirk Harnack's wardrobe provided by the Salvation Army and the Red Cross Disaster Relief Services. Hair and makeup provided by Penny Lope Garcia Hernandez Weinberg. He's unique, wouldn't you say? I just want to get it over with. This ends this transmission. Tango, Whiskey, India, Romeo, Tango. Signing off. Okay. <laughs>